Hello, everyone. Today, we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode, we're going to discuss why some animals aren't having sex. So let's jump right in. Whether or not you're having it, sex originated around 2 billion years ago, prior to the common ancestor of all eukaryotes. The common ancestor of animals, fungi, plants, and unicellular eukaryotes engage in sexual reproduction, even if not all of them do it today, which is the point of the tale. Underneath all the dances and songs that males perform for females, underneath the dazzling male plumage, underneath the wounds that males inflict on each other, sex in animals leads to fusing an egg with a sperm, resulting in a zygote. Animals are oogamous, meaning they have large immobile egg cells and small motile sperm cells. This condition, of course, wasn't the ancestral one for the first eukaryotes, but for today's purposes, it's the only one with which we need concern ourselves. Animals, by and large, reproduce sexually, but here and there, some individual species, or perhaps individual genera, have made the switch to asexuality. For example, females of numerous species of Drosophila will naturally drop an egg that occasionally develops parthenogenetically, and scientists have selected some Drosophila strains, including Melanogaster, to be fully asexual. The restoration of diploidy, or having two full sets of chromosomes, occurs by a process called automixis. When meiosis happens, a diploid stem cell is split ultimately into four haploid cells. For males, that's four sperm cells, but for females, the situation is different. The haploid cells divide unevenly, producing one large egg cell and three small polar bodies. This happens to ensure enough nutrients are stored to sustain the first rounds of cell division after fertilization. The egg cell is also loaded with maternal effectors, which initiate the first stage of morphogenesis, which we covered in the previous episode on the fruit fly's tail. However, something else also happens during meiosis. The initially diploid cell has two sets of duplicated chromosomes, each chromosome looking like an X. Meiosis 1 begins with one diploid cell with a pair of homologous chromosomes being split into two cells, each being haploid with just one set of homologous chromosomes. Meiosis 2 then splits each of those cells, splitting each chromosome into individual chromatids. The result is now four cells, each with a single set of chromatids from the initial cell with two sets of homologous chromosomes. Automixis then can occur in a few different ways. One way is called central fusion automixis, in which the homologous chromosomes fuse back into a single cell after meiosis 1, and terminal fusion automixis occurs when two chromatids fuse back into a single cell after meiosis 2. One well-studied example of a central fusion automixis is in the South African honeybee subspecies, Apis mellifera capensis. Though normally a sexually reproducing species, this subspecies gave rise to a lineage of asexual honeybees in 1990, which has been parasitizing commercial Apis mellifera scutellata colonies in South Africa. As for terminal fusion automixis, this has been reported in some mayflies, termites, or abated mites, and some sharks, like the swell shark. Finally, there is gamete duplication in which an egg undergoes a round of genetic duplication without cellular division. This has been reported in some hymenopterans and whiptail lizards of the genus Nemidophorus. The problem with automixis, though, is that natural diploid populations tend to have many deleterious recessive alleles, so an individual stands a rather large chance of inheriting two defective alleles, when engaging in terminal fusion automixis. The reason is that a chromosome is two identical sister chromatids joined at a centromere, so if the egg and polar body containing the sister chromatids combine into an offspring, that offspring will have inherited nearly its entire genome from just one parent. If that parent's chromatids had a deleterious recessive allele, then the offspring will inherit both copies of that allele. The same thing can happen from mating between close relatives, i.e. inbreeding. 
In non-automictic organisms, this dilemma is avoided by an offspring receiving its genome from both parents. Crossing over during meiosis 1 could alleviate this problem if a beneficial allele is swapped to the chromosome that gets passed to the offspring. However, it could also make the problem worse if a chromatid happens to receive a deleterious allele. Some asexual species like Drosophila mangabiri solve this problem by doing only central fusion automixis and eliminating crossing over altogether, making the offspring identical to the parents. With regard to terminal fusion automixis, the reduction in allelic diversity is clearly problematic if there are many deleterious recessive alleles. However, terminal fusion automixis can be stable if recombination is significantly reduced or paired with a phenomenon known as inverted meiosis. Inverted meiosis occurs when sister chromatids separate before homologous chromosomes do. When this occurs, it also leads to a reduction in recombination. In contrast to automixis is apomixis. During apomixis, the embryo develops directly from the parent bypassing meiosis. This is common in aphids, cladocerans, and the plant families Asteraceae, Poaceae, and Rosaceae. One type of apomixis is pseudogamy, in which a sperm cell is needed to stimulate egg division. The sperm donates no genetic material, but probably centrioles. This is known to occur in the Amazon molly, Poacilia formosa, from northeastern Mexico and southern Texas. And then there's hybridogenesis, which is extremely odd. When two species hybridize, the genetic material donated by the sperm is completely discarded. This is known to occur in hybrids of the marsh frog, Pelophylax esculenta, and Pelophylax ridibunda. Despite the abundance of asexual eukaryotes and the variety of their means of asexuality, there is a common theme. Asexuality tends to be restricted to individual species or a handful of species within a genus. Why might that be the case? To understand this, we must ask the broader question, why do sex at all? There are a bunch of downsides to sex. For starters, unless you self-fertilize, you have to find another individual with whom to mate. That might be fine if you live in a colony with a bunch of other individuals, but what if the next closest individual lives miles away? And even if you manage to find a mate, that mate could have some sort of sexually transmitted disease, or worst of all, the other individual could simply refuse to mate with you. And then there's what evolutionary biologist John Maynard Smith called the twofold cost of males. This is the dilemma where, assuming sexual and asexual populations are equally fecund, the per capita birth rate for asexual populations is twice that of sexual populations. This is because one half of the population cannot conceive new offspring, effectively cutting the potential reproductive rate in half. Because asexual organisms can reproduce faster, they may achieve immediate ecological success, but they then fall prey to whatever allelic hazards they all share. Despite these difficulties, sex is the rule, not the exception among eukaryotes. One well-known hypothesis to explain this is that sex allows for rapid adaptation through recombination. When crossing over occurs during meiosis 1, this allows for novel combinations of alleles to exist in individuals. The benefit of recombination is that two beneficial alleles formerly on separate chromosomes can be combined into a single one. Different hypotheses have been proposed to explain how natural selection works on recombination, such as the Vicar of Bray, the Tangled Bank, and the Red Queen. The Vicar of Bray hypothesis is named after a cleric who supposedly quickly switched his religious views depending on the dominant denomination in England. In biology, this hypothesis refers to how sexually reproducing organisms can rapidly adapt to changing environmental conditions, whereas asexual organisms would have to wait for a new mutation to crop up in that lineage. Some evidence to support this can be seen in organisms that can switch between sexual and asexual reproduction. These tend to reproduce asexually when conditions are stable and favorable, but if they are stressed by worsening conditions, they begin to reproduce asexually. This has also been dubbed the abandoned ship hypothesis. Second, the tangled bank describes how genetically variant offspring are more likely to be successful than clonal organisms in extracting resources from complex environments. 
And third, the Red Queen hypothesis, named after the Red Queen from Alice in Wonderland, argues that sex allows populations to out-adapt parasites. Matt Ridley authored a popular book about this hypothesis, and we discussed an experiment supporting it in our video, Experimental Evolution Part 1. But since sex is the rule and asexual lineages are almost always short-lived, we have to ask why there are three supposedly big exceptions, so-called evolutionary scandals, as John Maynard Smith labeled them, oribated mites, darwinulid ostracods, and deloid rotifers. First, mites of the order Oribatida independently evolved asexuality at least 11 times, and some ancestrally asexual lineages even re-evolved sexuality, such as the genus Mesoplophora. Based on fossils from the Devonian, oribated mites have been around for upwards of 400 million years, making them an exceptionally old asexual lineage. So, what's going on here? Oribated mites are small animals ranging from 150 to 1400 micrometers with a wide geographical distribution. These characteristics also hold for our asexual ostracods and rotifers. Why might that be important? It is well understood in population genetics that large population sizes result in extremely strong natural selection. As the 2017 paper, Effective Purifying Selection in Ancient Asexual Oribated Mites, writes, quote, Generally, small body size and large geographic range are indicative of high abundances of organisms, which suggests that large population sizes might alleviate the negative effects of loss of sex, close quote. Mathematically, the reason for this is the formula, effective population size, multiplied by the selection coefficient. For reference, selection coefficient is a measure of the strength of selection acting against a particular genotype. If a mutation is lethal, then S equals 1, or there is a 100% chance the mutation will change in its frequency over one generation. Another way of putting it is the fitness of a lethal mutation is 0. If the effective population size multiplied by the selection coefficient is greater than 1, then selection will operate on the mutation. However, if the effective population size multiplied by the selection coefficient is less than 1, then the mutation is subject to drift, being functionally invisible to selection. Therefore, in small populations, only strongly negative or positive mutations can be weeded out or fixed, respectively, by selection. This is also why, by contrast, in populations with extremely high numbers of individuals, like prokaryotes, even just a few non-functional nucleotides can be subject to selection, which is why prokaryotes tend to have so little non-functional DNA. Moving into the realm of multicellular eukaryotes, their populations are much smaller than those of prokaryotes, so mutations must have stronger effects to be noticed by selection. This has resulted in eukaryotic genomes being much more convoluted and extravagant than necessary. Darwinulid ostracods are a bit more recent in their switch to asexuality, making the change between 200 and 100 million years ago. Aside from having very large population sizes, one unique aspect of Darwinulid ostracods is their very slow rate of evolution. There are very small morphological differences between Darwinulid genera and species, and studies of Darwinulid genes further confirm that their genes evolve much slower compared to other clades of ostracods. This very slow rate of evolution could help Darwinulids avoid accumulating too many deleterious mutations. However, the evolution rate of Darwinulids is not uniquely low. Other non-marine ostracods have similarly low rates of evolution, so it could be the case that this slow rate was not an adaptation to asexuality, but a pre-adaptation for it. And finally, we have the rotifers, to whom go the tail. Rotifera is a phylum of tiny aquatic animals that are found worldwide. Rotifer means wheelbearer because the corona around the mouth seems to move like a wheel when feeding. However, it does not actually rotate. The phylum has traditionally been recognized to hold three classes, Cycinoidea, Monogonta, and Deloidea. Cycinoidea is only known to inhabit the gills of the crustacean Nibalia, and Monogonta is a clade of free-living rotifers. Deloid rotifers have long been recognized as an ancient asexual lineage, 
and the very few known deloid rotifer fossils, like one found in the 35 million year old Dominican amber, look pretty similar to their modern counterparts. According to a 2000 study, deloid rotifers may have been asexual for as many as 80 million years. Yet again, we have to ask, if there are so many asexual rotifer species, over 450, then what is the secret to their success? The answer here seems to be a bit different from that of mites or ostracods. Horizontal gene transfer. While this process is common among prokaryotes and unicellular eukaryotes, it is pretty rare among animals. A 2008 study by Eugene Gladyshev et al. showed that deloid rotifers have an unusually high number of genes, up to 10%, of bacterial, plant, and fungal origin, and a later 2012 study by Chiara Boschetti et al. showed that 80% of those horizontally acquired genes do indeed code for enzymes. Similar to tardigrades, rotifers can enter a stage of cryptobiosis where they lay dormant for many years. In one instance, deloid rotifers were revived from 24,000-year-old Arctic permafrost. The importance of this is that rotifers can sustain multiple DNA double-stranded breaks during desiccation that are repaired upon rehydration, allowing for the incorporation of foreign DNA. A 2015 paper by Isabel Ayers et al. demonstrated that horizontal gene transfer is higher in species that experience repeated desiccation. Alternatively, a 2015 paper by Anna Senorovich et al. argued that rotifers engage in extremely rare but unusual sex. The only instance of a researcher claiming to have witnessed a male rotifer was in 1930, and even then his account was heavily qualified. That doesn't necessarily mean there are no males. It could be the case that deloids produce males only under certain conditions, but this evidence, combined with the lack of homologous chromosomes in deloids, seems to indicate no meiosis, and therefore no sex. However, Senorovich proposed that deloids might have a meiotic process, similar to that of Enothera primroses, which also don't line up homologous chromosomes during meiosis. Instead, the chromosomes form a ring, where paternal and maternal chromosomes alternate. Recombination does not occur except around telomeric regions. Then, in anaphase 1, the chromosomes segregate by parentage, and the rest of meiosis proceeds normally. It is worth pointing out that, to date, no rotifers have been shown to exhibit this meiosis type. Then, a 2016 paper by Nicholas Dabortoli et al. tested the horizontal gene transfer versus rare sex hypotheses, by collecting genetic data from almost 600 Adenita vega individuals in a Belgium park. What they found was asexual evolution for most genetic regions inconsistent with meiosis, and regions that experienced intra-individual horizontal gene transfer were not simply the telomeric regions predicted by Senorovich. Either way, there is clearly sharing of genetic material between individual rotifers meaning that they cannot be classified as classic asexuals. Thus, the days of rotifers as an evolutionary scandal are at an end. Even still, oribated mites and darwinulid ostracods are still considered to be ancient asexuals unless they too are engaging in some unknown methods of genetic exchange between individuals. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.